I'm Tom Zwicky, and the first thing I want to announce, which we're all very excited about, is that PyMC 4.0, if you don't know what PyMC is, you've come to the right talk, this is what I'm going to be talking about. But the new major release is now finally out, and uh, yeah, it's amazing. It has a new JAX backend uh, for faster sampling, it has GPU support, and it used to be based on Theano, which was discontinued. It's like basically a Tensor framework before TensorFlow was cool. TensorFlow isn't cool anymore before TensorFlow and JAX was cool. Um, but now it's based on uh, Sara, And it has a whole bunch of other cool stuff. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. But more from an uh, applied business sense. And I remember when I was in grad school and fell in love with Bayesian modeling, I always had this thought of like, well, how is it being used in business? Is it even being used in business? And that there was very little information on that out there. So in a way, I made this talk for myself just uh, eight years ago uh, to basically show how business is using PyMC modeling. The experience I have now is from PyMC Labs, which is our basic consultancy. And uh, basically, we're a team out of the core developers of PyMC, and we just banded together and now started to work on consulting projects, helping startups to Fortune 500 companies solve hard data science problems using Bayesian modeling. And when I recently thought about, like, well, where have we made the biggest impact, mainly actually two domains uh, are most active in, in Bayesian modeling, it seems. One is life sciences. Uh, where we consult with companies like Roche, Indigo, but also marketing. Uh, and that was more of a surprise to me just because, well, life sciences make sense. It's very close to, the, uh, to, to science, right? And Bayesian modeling has always been more established in academia. But marketing, uh, I didn't know much about, but like just all these marketing companies basically were writing us and wanting support uh, and help building their various models. And in this talk, what I'm going to do is basically use marketing as the example case study for how the benefits of Bayesian modeling are particularly impactful there and why they haven't um, adopted it so much. So, yeah, why specifically marketing? To set the stage, there is, I think, a couple of trends that support this, but really I think a lot of these reasons are transferable to many industries. Like most of them, they're very quantitative by now, right? Like the data science approach there is fully uh, present. And, but there are also some other things, like for example, in general, the internet, right? Everyone's becoming more privacy conscious. So these third, third party tracking cookies by now are basically going away. Uh, it's called the death of the cookie. So it's just very hard to track people online these days, which I guess is a good thing, but hard if you want to track people online and know where your marketing dollars are going. So it makes it very hard for marketers to actually know wh whether what they're spending on certain platforms is effective or not, or how effective it is. And that's the problem that we're going to look at. And then the third one is in-house, so it makes sense that they're adopting open source tools like PyMC. So the thesis that I'm going to put forward is that Bayesian modeling is the perfect tool to address these and more challenges. And we're going to look at probably the prime example of marketing, which is estimating marketing effectiveness. So how effective are my marketing channels? And towards this, we're going to use just very, very simple simulated data, uh, where over time now, I have two time series. I have how much I spent in thousands of dollars and how many new customers I got, right? So obviously that's the whole point of marketing is to sell more products or get more marketing and uh, to get more users. And here you can see this effect that like, well, if we spend a lot of money, we get a lot of new users. If we drop our marketing spend, we just get very few users, right? So very simple. And we're going to do some simplifying assumptions, which we then later on will review. But basically, this first section of the talk is just to build intuitions about what Bayesian modeling even is and how to think about it, and then basically take it further than that and show more advanced case studies. But here, we're going to start very simple and going to care about just uh, assume that we just have a single channel here, right? So let's say it's all just Google ads, right? Usually, you would have Facebook ads and everything, but 
Here it's just, well, we're spending marketing dollars on this one thing and we're getting new users. And the central thing that we're interested in is our customer acquisition cost, the CAC. And I'm going to be using this a lot, so remember what the CAC is. It is how many marketing dollars do I have to spend to get one new customer, right? So that's in general what we care about. And the other thing which we care about, of course, is how much we gain from a user. So how much does it cost me to get one and how much do I earn in terms of the whole lifetime that they're with me, which is the customer lifetime value. And we're going to assume that that is also just a made up number. It's usually uh, quite a bit lower than that. Uh, we're going to assume that that is $630 um, on average. And of course, then the question is, well, do I have to spend more in marketing than I get from that customer? So this is basically that threshold that we want to cross. And well, if we were very naive about this, you might think, well, actually, this is a super simple problem, right? So here now, I'm just plotting this data differently. So I'm ignoring the time domain. And I'm just saying, OK, this is how much I spend on ads. And this is how many new customers I got. And of course, we see, well, it's clearly correlated, right? The more I spend, the more new customers I get. Um, and maybe if I take off my glasses, um, we might think, OK, whether well, this is like linear-ish. Maybe not. But for now, we're going to um, fit a linear regression to this, right? This is what uh, statisticians do. And um, if we do that, then actually the, the CAC, the custom acquisition cost, just falls out of it. Uh, right, so the, the slope of this is I move one point here and then x points here, but I want the inverse of that. I want to know, well, if I move one point here, how much do I have to spend for one new user? Right, that's the CAC. So it's one over the slope, it's the inverse. And if I do that, right, it's just a single line and whatever stats package you want, uh, the result is 647.97 precisely. Right, so amazing with statistics, we get very precise answers. Um, and uh, that means it's a bad channel because, well, we had, we assumed that we had to spend 630, uh, well, that we earned 630 from this, right? So now maybe some of you in the audience are like, well, not so fast, Thomas. Um, there are a couple of problems with this, and I fully admit to that. Um, one of the problems is, well, this line could be a good fit, right? But what about this line? Or these lines, right? They're all, I don't know, sort of go through that point cloud. And, and how plausible are they? Are they also plausible? And maybe I take, maybe I, I'm, I'm trying to be good based in, and I'm taking this to uh, the marketing team. And I'm saying like, okay, well, these are all different values that could work here. And then the marketing team actually tells me, well, even without like knowing anything about this data, I already know that like, 959, like this value in red is like completely impossible. Like no marketing channel is ever going to be that ineffective, right? So ahead of time, we can rule this value out, but with just running a linear regression, if that is the best answer that's provided, well, that is still the answer I'm going to get, right? So in this simplified framework, I don't have a way of excluding certain things that I know are just completely ridiculous. So three things are missing from this. Uh, the uncertainty, right, which I showed is, well, we don't just want that single line, which gives me like this super precise answer. We want to have some sense of like, well, are other fits plausible and how plausible are they? Uh, the other thing which we saw is that we can't include any domain knowledge, that anything, say, above 900 is just completely unreasonable and don't even need to consider it. Uh, and then, of course, uh, now that I have my glasses back on, this is uh, not linear, right? So there's definitely some saturation and this is very common. What you see in marketing is just like showing someone the same ad 10 times is not going to be twice as effective as showing it five times, right? There's a saturation effect where it's just, yeah, the message just stops sort of carrying through. And this is a big problem and this is why also you're not just usually using a single channel but many channels. And uh, yeah, so those are all drawbacks, I guess. And now we want to solve them. And well, how do we solve them? This is where our friend, the reverend, <laughs> comes in. Um, he had this whole thing figured out hundreds of years ago. Uh, actually, it's not just uh, Thomas Bayes, but it's Laplace, uh, who we have to thank for this, but history can be cruel sometimes. Uh, but anyway, so Bayes it is. 
Um, and I like to introduce that by just some comparison with some techniques which some people here might be more familiar with, which is that of machine learning, or I'm going to narrow it down to black box machine learning, where we have some data, we pump that into a classifier, we have data which is like features and labels, right? Classifier and outcomes predictions. And cool. That works, right? Uh, XGBoost, really powerful tools, scikit-learn. But if, and if we only care about that, then that's totally fine. If we only care about prediction, but maybe we care also about understanding something in our data, right? Like maybe we have some knowledge about the causal structure of how my data was generated that I can't really incorporate here, right? So it's purely data-driven, and I can't really, yeah, um, uh, do any inference with this. And, well, the nature that it's black box means I can't look inside, right? So anything that the classifier learns, it can't really communicate to me and explain to me what it has learned, right? So that, that learning is just happening in there in some crazy uh, high-dimensional space, um, and yeah, I can't, uh, I can't look at it. And then, um, well, as I mentioned, it's very automatic, which is cool, but the downside is, well, if you have information that you incorporate, that is very difficult, so it's just data-driven. Now, contrasting that with Bayesian modeling, which I hear as, as an open box or transparent, transparent box. Um, here, of course, we also start with data, but we then build a, <coughs> excuse me, a custom Bayesian model. And outcome, not predictions, but probabilities. So the whole thing is incorporated in probabilities. And, well, it's transparent, right? So the model that I built is custom, and it's in computer code, and I just can look at it and, and investigate and really, and communicate it to other people, that is really important. It's composable, meaning I just assemble a model out of very simple building blocks. It's basically the Lego approach to doing statistical modeling, where we just have these individual probability distributions, we plug them into each other, and we can that way build very flexible models on all kinds of different things. And it has the ability to um, work in a more causal way, right? So if I know how my data was generated, I know something about the uh, generative process, I just incorporate that, that, that basically becomes my model. So it's a, a generative framework, and that is for me just a very intuitive way of thinking about my data science problem, right? It's like, well, how was my data generated? And that's just how I'm going to build my model. And as I said, the whole thing is probabilistic, uh, which for me is probably the best way of expressing um, yeah, uncertainty and, and things like that, right? So everything we do will always have probabilities associated with it, so we're not just getting point estimates, um, like that single linear line, but we're actually getting a whole probability distribution of things. But for me, actually, my favorite part of this is that it's very code-friendly. So it used to be, back in the days of, of base and, and later, uh, that you just had this very simple formula of base formula, uh, but it actually was not all that useful because you couldn't really solve it, right? If you just like tried out to work out the math, it just became really, really ugly. Uh, Chris was just mentioning that uh, on his, in his tutorial. And uh, fortunately though, now we have very powerful approximation algorithms, and this, these make this very powerful, especially if you combine it then with a uh, language that allows you to define these models in computer code. So for me, with a computer science background and not a statistics background, a math background, this is the way that I like to do statistics, right? It's, it's not just on a blackboard, but rather in Jupyter Notebook, coding my model, I find a problem with it, I iteratively improve it just like I would with code. So that, that for me is like my, my, the superpower for me. So from a high level, and uh, basically this is uh, so the, the um, still in the building intuitions part, we're gonna take it up a notch soon. So we start out with solution proposals. So as I said before, right, we can communicate with the marketing department, they tell us, well, certain values uh, are just completely implausible, right? So they might tell us, well, custom acquisition costs over 900 are impossible, so when I define my space of solutions to this problem, which are the CACs, right, the thing that I'm interested in, I can already exclude that here. So that's the first thing, right, that we wanted to be able to do. And this is where we can include domain knowledge. And then we build the model, and as I said, it's generative. 
and I basically, this is, I can incorporate various model structures. So this is where I really say, okay, well, this is what my data was generated. Let me now build um, um, a graph representation of that that maps it and that I incorporate in, in the framework. Then I evaluate whether that's whether these solutions, right, that I'm taking from here, plugging into the model, and then evaluating on the data, that gives me the answer, is that now a plausible solution or not, right? So either it's a good fit or it's a terrible fit, like I don't know, this line would be. And then if I just keep doing that over and over, and this is where the MCMC sampler comes in that is doing the inference, so this is just being run in a loop, and it gives me then the collection of plausible values that all do a good job of explaining the data that I've seen. So all these different CAC values here, right, there's this histogram over a thousand potential values that the custom acquisition cost could reasonably be given the data I have. And the main thing to note, of course, is this is not a point estimate, right? So before, what we started with was just like, oh, it's basically, yeah, um, 647.98. Uh, and now it's, well, it could be anything from 600 to, um, no, 500 to, 680, or up until 700, and this is scaled on the y, um, on the y-axis. So that's the high-level idea. But I also also mentioned well, the superpower, if you remember, is that we can do that in code. So rather than having the model in just statistical speak, we just write it down in computer code. And yeah, that's very susceptible to the iterative workflow. Now let's start looking at the solution proposals. This is what Bayesians like to call priors. I'm not a particular big fan of these more traditional terms, so that's why I'm using different ones. But uh, yeah, so priors specify my belief in different values of the custom acquisition cost. Right, so these are all potential values that the custom acquisition cost could be without having seen any data. And I'm assigning a probability here using a probability distribution. And this is the one that I came up with, right? So it says everything under 900 is just very implausible. Which, and everything below, uh, well, zero is also very implausible. Now let's look at the code. Um, I hope this won't be too scary. If you haven't seen this, don't worry too much about it. I'm, I'm going to go a little bit quicker, but at least I wanted to give you a flavor so that you have an intuition for how this roughly looks like, right? So uh, don't worry too much. So the first line is just boilerplate. We're setting up a new model with uh, PyMC, so PM uh, imported as PyMC. And the first two lines are the parameters of a model. Really, so far, it's just a linear regression model, so it has an intercept, which I call baseline, and it has the slope, which is the CAC. But I don't just specify these parameters, I also assign priors to them, right? So the plausible space that I just mentioned before. And the first, and uh, this is a normal distribution that I'm going to assign here. These are these two. And I give it a name, I give it a mean, and a standard deviation. And this just basically incorporates my knowledge without having seen any data. Now that I have the parameters, I, <coughs> I combine them in my linear regression formula, right? So intercept plus uh, the data. This is a NumPy array of this, these values on the x-axis times 1 over the slope, right? If you remember, CAC was the inverse, so I'm just doing that here. I have a parameter for the variance in my data, the epsilon the noise, that's a half normal, which is um, a normal distribution that's chopped up at zero because variances can only be positive. So this is, and this is trivial prior information that I always have, right? So certain things just are natural laws that I'm incorporating here. And then finally, I have to specify how that relates to my data. And this is where, uh, this is called the likelihood, and I pass in my predictions that come from this right here, my estimation noise, and then the data that I've observed, which is the number of customers, so my y values here. So x trans uh, the x values transformed via this formula give rise to the y values that I'm plotting here. So nothing magical, right? Parameters, linear regression, data. And the coolest thing is I don't have to do any math, right? So I usually the math behind this model um, might be quite complex. In this case, it, it's simple, but if you just would build this up, as we're going to do, then this would be really gnarly. And nonetheless, it doesn't matter what you write up here to, to an extent. Um, you just call what I like to call the inference button. 
uh, pm.sample, and it'll just basically do that thing for you, which I described to you here, of running this loop and giving you this distribution of my plausible values, the thing that I'm interested in, right? The posterior. And, well, this is what it looks like, and this is basically it, right? So then we're done. We just run the sampler, we build a model, we run the sampler, and we investigate the results, and this is the answer we get. And I already said, well, this is nice because it has this uh, uncertainty in, in what plausible values could be. But rather than just looking at it, it's really useful, and here we can also contrast this now with frequent statistics, where maybe the thing, uh, if you remember from before, the customer lifetime value, we wanted to test was the CAC higher, how do I have to spend more than I get from getting a customer? And, uh, well, if we were to do this in a frequentist framework, we would have to like find a specific test for that, right? Someone would have to derive already the right test for doing this. And that is another cool feature about Bayesian modeling is that these tests basically just are free, right? So once you have this posterior, you can just investigate this however you like. So to answer our question of, um, whether it's below 6.3, well, we just count how many values are below 0 0.63, so you have to multiply by 100, um, I apologize for that, so 630 was the value, right, um, which translates to 0 0.63 here, but it doesn't matter because all we're doing is really just slicing that posterior upon that value which we care about and can now say, okay, which, how much, how many of those values, what percentage of values below that, and the thing that comes out when I do this is a probabilistic answer, which is 25% probability that this channel is profitable. And that's, that's simple and awesome, right? Because that you can just take to someone and say, okay, well, this is, this is the answer basically that you're looking for. If you want to invest, invest in this channel, this is the risk that you're taking on. And well, in business, we're always taking real world decisions and uh, so, if, so having that sense of uncertainty, if that's just probabilities, is really, really important so that you know how, what kind of risk you're taking on. So as Drake would say, forget about point estimates, use distributional estimates. Exactly. So that was the intro. Now we're gonna crank it up a little bit um, and talk about improving the model. And this is work that we did at PyMC Labs together with HelloFresh. These are the people involved. Um, where they started out with a, simple that a model that was a little bit more complex than that, um, and there were a couple of improvements that we did. And one of the first things, uh, which is quite simple, if you remember right, that was not linear, that data. So, well, one easy thing to do is to then use a nonlinear decay function. So this is called a reach function here, and, well, it works like you can see here. And if I do this in gray now, you can see the model fit. It fits the data perfectly. Well, because that's the way I generated it. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, but the point here is that uh, I, I'm not showing the code, but trust me, that it's just a very simple three-line code change, right? So in terms of this iterative process, um, I see, oh, this is actually a terrible fit. Now I do this change. Now it's a better fit. And now I can just keep improving it just with simple code changes. Well, the other thing, as I mentioned before, is we made that simplifying assumption that we only have uh, this one channel. In reality, we have many of them. And now you might say, well, that's simple. I just build, uh, instead of linear regression, a multivariate linear regression, and I just include many different channels. And this is essentially what you end up doing is you have a separate parameter which tracks the custom acquisition cost per channel for each channel's data. And you do that k times if you have k number of channels. And that's fine, you can do that. But what if uh, you do that and this is what it looks like? So let's say we have now uh, several posteriors, uh, the plausible values that look like this for different channels, and one of them is just all the way over here. And maybe this is also one way you don't have tons of data for. So do you really believe that, well, they're all over here and this one just is basically an outlier, right? So the model itself can't incorporate that, right? Because there's no relationship between these parameters. They're all is estimated independently. Uh, and this is what allows for something like this to happen. However, if we apply a really cool trick, we can turn this into a hierarchical model where we say, actually, I have some information about these individual parameters in that they come from a global overarching distribution. And 
how to think about that is, well, we have a distribution here, and these points are the means of the distributions, and this is the group distribution that I'm assuming, and if I assume this group distribution, right, that they all follow a normal distribution, these ones down here, then this mean is very, very unlikely, right? Because it's all the way over here, and what the model will do in response, so this is not the actual fit, this is what the model would say if I were to propose this, um, but if I were to estimate this, it would pull this estimate in because it would say, okay, well, actually, I know more about this distribution, this sharing of information between things. And uh, these hierarchical models are extremely powerful, and wherever you have nested data, right, the we see this pattern all the time, but it's very rarely actually facilitated in the modeling process. So, yeah, um, especially if you have wide data where you don't have a lot of data per class, this is something to really look into. And uh, actually, directly after this, um, Hannah has given a talk in room three uh, about this type of modeling, so definitely check that out. Um, another thing we can do is, well, now we have uh, assumed so far that the customer acquisition cost is constant over time, right? So the first thing I did when I changed from the time series plot to the other one was to throw away the time dimension. Is that really plausible that, um, I don't know, during COVID, uh, marketing was as effective as uh, pre-COVID? Probably not, right? Things change, the world is changing all the time. And what we did for that model then was to say, well, instead of assuming that it's constant, we can allow it to vary over time and model this uh, for those of you who know more about this using Gaussian processes, which are time-varying processes, uh, time-varying time series processes that allow basically for, rather than just constant over time, each channel now has some pattern. And that's neat, we can estimate this. Um, it's actually really hard because uh, now we have, for every, uh, before we just had um, a handful of params, right, for every channel we had one and then the noise. Um, now we have all of a sudden like blew, bl blown up the complexity of this model tremendously. We have, uh, for every time point, for our channel, a new parameter, right, that's following this very complex structure due to the process that, the, the um, Gaussian process that we facilitated here. And when we first did that, it actually didn't work. It didn't converge um, because there's not enough information to really estimate this over time. But if we combine this now with the previous idea, right, of a hierarchical model, we can sort of assume the same thing here. So during COVID, yes, uh, the marketing changed, but probably it changed across all these channels, right? Like they were all impacted in a similar way. Um, so we can say, okay, well, let's combine this idea with this idea and build basically a hierarchical time varying process. So uh, yeah, we, and we, we can just do that, right? We write it down. Um, now we have this global time varying process overarching this, which like will drop everything down during COVID, and, but still allow for individual variation, right? So it's not that they're all the same. They can deviate, uh, but this will regularize this. Really, that's all this is. It's like very fancy regularization. And, um, uh, and this is what made the model work then, right? So it's, it's kind of uh, maybe counterintuitive that we add like all this super crazy structure to it, and now it's actually working, but what we're doing is we're constraining the model um, and, and giving it less degrees of freedom more parameters, but less degrees of freedom, and that allows it to estimate it even if you don't have a ton of data. Uh, because really what we're doing is we're injecting more prior information to this. And um, yeah, so uh, <laughs> this is the joke from uh, Spinal Tap, uh, where we're really turning things up to 11, um, because the model by now is like insane, right? It has like uh, by now tens of thousands of parameters, uh, this super crazy structure. But again, I just call pm.sample, the inference button, and it, it it just works, and um, it takes, um, I think, 20 minutes to estimate. So this is, I guess, another thing, uh, the a message I want to send out is you, these tools used to be more for toy models, but by now with sampling on the GPU and stuff like that, they really allow to build complex, large-scale models that scale. So it's not a toy anymore. And just to show you that I'm not uh, just making this up, this is based on real-world data um, from HelloFresh. These are all the different marketing channels, and you can see, yeah, so there is definitely some variability. Some of them look quite different. This very choppy one is one that is like very saturated, which 
leads to this weird looking effect. But yeah, so, um, so this is basically the inside. And of course, because we're good proper Bayesians, we have uncertainty estimates around these lines as well. We have um, tested this model. So basically, these models are called Bayesian media mix models. Uh, and they're quite popular in marketing. And uh, ours is not the only one. There are a couple of other ones uh, which we decided to compare it against. So there's uh, the Google one. Um, they have also a package for that. There's an Uber just came out with a paper where they also have time varying components. So we compared this on held out data. And uh, so here lower is better, here higher is better. And I'm very happy to say uh, that, that our model is the best. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't show that graph. Um, another thing that is often being done, um, or that, well, that actually has a very high practical business uh, application, is that uh, is a what if scenario analysis. So, uh, basically, the, the marketing team at HelloFresh is really excited about this because it really it matches the way that they think. So, here they can now go in and inquire in the model certain things, right? So, for example, what happens? to my expected new users over the next month if I were to drop my marketing spend to zero, or I have it, or I leave it is, or I double it. And we can forecast all these different ones, and then they can make informed decisions on the model, and they, uh, yeah, so it's, it's really uh, facilitating their decision making. And, uh, well, a couple of things to note, of course, we get um, uncertainty in our forecast, but also it's not just a flat line. We get um, uh, things like seasonality included as well. The final point I want to make is that something that's very powerful often, especially if you ha uh, work in this regime where maybe you have a lot of data but not a lot of information, is adding other data sources that are related to this and adjacent. So you can just yeah, build a more complex model that uh, says, well, I actually know something more about the custom acquisition cost. For example, in this case, they ran these lift tests, which are essentially A-B tests, but they're very expensive, so you only run them very infrequently. So this is what happens here on these points. And you can put that into the model and say, well, actually, here I ran this lift test, and this is what it said, and it will use that to inform the other estimates as well. But they also have voucher redemption, so I include that. And actually, in their case, there's this, like, uh, internal political debate going on between, oh, like vouchers give us much better information and other people say like, no, it should be just the marketing spend. Uh, so why not do both? Um, and uh, yeah, and but this can be done, of course, in, in many different uh, scenarios as well. So when does uh, Bayesian modeling work best? To, to summarize this, Whenever you don't have a simple prediction problem, you want to learn something about your data, you want to gain insight into your data, and you have structured data, like maybe you have nested hierarchical structure in there, you have time series, some causalness that you know something about, it allows you to integrate domain knowledge. And when you're making real-world decisions, uncertainty often plays a really big role, right? So you want to make sure to incorporate that. Um, one more final announcement. If you want to learn about this, no better way than checking out intuitivebase.com, which is a self-paced learning course that is going to come out in a week or two. So it's almost done. We're very excited about it. Um, and we're basically, if you like this style of like presenting things in a more code-first, intuitive way, this is what we did there, because we were all frustrated with the way that Bayesian modeling is usually taught. Uh, and it's made for people who like to code, the data scientists and Python developers. So uh, if you want the slides, um, I'm going to tweet them. Um, if you have problems where you think these types of approaches could be helpful for your business, uh, happy to get an email from you. And we also run corporate workshops. So with that, thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Do, does anyone have a question? Ask a question. Hi, um, thanks for the talk, first of all. I wanted to ask about the slide you had where you were including other data sources. Um, yeah, that one. So 
because we work on similar problems and we, we include data sources like that are not directly marketing related, so things like you know, the time of year and the day, the month, which are not, you know, they're not really related to how much you spend on advertising or like sending vouchers. So have you kind of looked at the effect of including those sorts of variables as well? Like weak day effects or? Like, like what, sorry? Uh, 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 what type of effects? I missed the first part. So what data sources do you have? So things like, so because we work on very similar problems, but as input variables, we also include things like the um, day of the year, the the week of the year, that yeah. kind of thing. So yeah. yeah, so that is included here as well. So yeah. seasonality, right? Like yeah. on Christmas, things are very different than um, yeah. So Christmas. that can be like explicitly included as well. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so. Yeah, the, the way these uh, Gaussian processes work, they allow you to include some cyclicality. Um, and then on top of that, uh, as covariates, you can include, uh, like, yeah, this is like a holiday, um, and maybe even um, a, a value indicating how significant you that, that is to your time series. Yeah, yeah, so they can all be done. Thanks. Behind you. Just a quick question, yeah. So sometimes I'm getting, like, a very wide height posterior density interval you know, for the coefficients. And when I use more informative priors, you know, it's getting narrowed down a little bit. And it's hard to define what exact priors, you know, to use for stochastical uh, variables. So what is your recommendation for that? For choosing priors? Yes, you know what I mean? When, when you choose like, lo like more informative priors, your HDI interval getting a little bit narrow. But it's hard to define like where to stop, you know. This is always the problem I hit, so I try to find the middle to bring to my team of analytics because they always ask me, oh, why are your intervals changing all the time, you know? I see, yeah. Um, yeah, so priors is definitely a very uh, often debated uh, topic. Usually, um, we come up from it from two sides. One is, well, yeah, we want to incorporate as much information as possible. Uh, but also we want to use it in a regularizing way, right? So, yeah, if you run a linear regression, often you would place normal priors centered around zero because you say, well, in the absence of anything, I'm just going to say zero. I'm going to err on the side of uh, there not being effect, um, which is very similar to what machine learners have been doing for ever. Um, and, but, yeah, so priors are something which is totally fine to iteratively work on and improve. So, uh, yeah, the fact that, that you're changing them and, and improving them and that the results change is, is not a problem per se. So that just means yet that your model is hopefully getting better. Um, but, yeah, um, so in general, the whole Bayesian field is moving towards informative priors. And, like, we started out with, like, uniform priors everywhere, right? And that just turned out to be a terrible idea. Um, Right, yeah. Um, so yeah, in, uh, incorporating information is, is critical, especially for these complex models there. Like if you don't have informative priors there, they just won't even get off the ground. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, oh, I guess the last point, prior predictive checks is another really cool thing. I can see you and you, anyone else have a question? Okay, I'll come here first and then keep your hands up, I'll bring the mic. Thank you. So my question was about uh, the likelihood. So use a normal distribution, but is there a way to test, or how would you test this assumption is valid? Yeah, uh, so great question. The first thing I would do after I fit this is to run a posterior predictive check, where I simulate new data from the model and then see how well the model explains the uh, real data I've seen, right? And often that will actually show like, oh, this isn't fitting the data at all, maybe because I have some outlier. And in that case, I would then say, well, I'm going to replace my normal distribution, normal likelihood, with a student t distribution, which has a lot of mass in the tails and is robust. And then I run the posterior predictive check again, and I see, like, oh, now it nicely fits the data and it's not skewed by outliers. So we'll just take the last three questions together. So just ask the questions, and then maybe you can summarize. I'm mainly just asking, um, you, you treated the channels mostly independently, and you, but you, know, you mentioned that sometimes they, they can affect each other and you can have cannibalization in some cases and all sorts of other stuff. Is that in some way taken into account and just... Yeah, so this was uh, the point on this slide, is that we're, uh, that they're changing, but they're actually, they're cha there's a hierarchical model underneath this. So they're all actually tied, to, they're not independent. They're all tied together via this global timering process, uh, basically mapping this idea from here that, yeah, these things do share similarity. So, um, yeah, during COVID, um, like everything would go down and, and this would affect all of them individually. And the 
you built some type of uh, automated budget allocator on top of this as well that then optimizes, uh, yeah? I like the way you think, yes, yeah. um, exactly. So this is uh, called Bayesian decision making. Um, and so you could just, and lo what a lot of people do is they just take the estimates, they run an optimizer, and then they get some answers. Uh, but you want to include the whole posterior in this as well, right? So that you're not just optimizing for the most likely case, but across all cases. So that way you're getting way more robust estimates. Um, there's a blog post I wrote about this um, on Bayesian decision making on twiki.io, which is my blog. So, um, but yeah, th that's exactly where this is going. The next step would be plugging this into an optimizer to tell me what is the optimal allocation of my media spend um, to do that. And final question, or I think so. Um, how is it uh, captured the fact that spending money today will have an impact not only on the new users uh, tomorrow or mm. even in the long term? I, how is that incorporated in the way you, you, you presented it? Yeah. Um, so I showed you this uh, decay fun the situation function. There's another function, which is an exponential decay function forward where like a marketing thing does not inf just have an effect today but actually uh, over the next couple of days and then so that, that's essentially convolution um, and that is called the, uh, the the ad stock function so there's two the basic MMM has yeah the, de the saturation function and the ad stock function to model the effect that you have and, and that is included in there I just didn't mention it cool thank you so much everyone thank and you the, the rest of the day thanks Thomas